All right, good afternoon, gentlemen. Um, today we are going to begin, um, how do you present the gospel? Uh, the gospel can be you know, said in a few words or it, you can take a long time to explain all of the details and everything. Um, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. That's the basic gospel. Uh, but presenting it to people uh, requires a lot more than that. Uh, there are a number of things that a, a person needs to understand, I think, in order to get to the point where they will trust Christ. And obviously that's what we're trying to do, is to move people to trust Christ as their Savior and be born into the family of God. Um, so we're going to go through a number of steps that I think uh, are good uh, in presenting the gospel. Uh, the first one is everyone is a sinner less perfect than God. Okay, everyone is a sinner less perfect than God. That's the, the first uh, teaching, the first doctrine uh, that we want to share with a lost person. Um, and I'm going to give you a number of verses and then talk about how I would recommend you present that. Um, Romans chapter 3 verse 23 is probably the favorite verse of people to use in explaining to people that they are sinners. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Okay, a very simple statement, for all have sinned. Every single person is a sinner. There are very, very few people who do not believe that they're sinners. I think I have literally met one person uh, in the 50-something years that I've been saved uh, who did not believe that she was a sinner. Um, so it's very uncommon. Uh, but it could be in other places, other religions and so on. Maybe they have different ideas. Um, but we need to convince people that they are sinners. Uh, if they don't believe they're guilty before God, then they're probably not interested in finding a Savior. So all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we'll get to uh, more about that verse in a little bit. Uh, another good one, Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 20, it says, For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Okay, not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Um, Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Okay, so we're all as an unclean thing. And this is important, and you may need to use this sometimes with people. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. It's very, very typical that people think that they are accumulating righteousnesses, righteous deeds, righteous actions, that they are going to offer to God for their salvation. Um, the Bible says that our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, okay? Filthy rags, not, they're nothing in the sight of God. In fact, they're worse than nothing. The works that we offer to God are reprehensible to God. Romans chapter 3, verse, verse 10 as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. None righteous, not one. Romans chapter 3, verse 12, uh, part B, or the second part of that verse, there is none that doeth good, no, not one. Now there are some people that will object to that part. Not one good person. The truth is most people think that they are basically good. Okay, and that's not the truth, but that's what most people think of themselves. Okay, God's verdict <coughs> is no, not one. None of us are good. Okay, the presentation of this. Uh, most people understand they're not perfect. Um, in my experience in America, most people are willing to admit uh, that they're not perfect. They may think they're good in their own mind. You know, comparing yourselves to other people, you may look at other people and say, well, I'm better than Jim, but I'm not as good as Mark. Okay? 
that's not the way God looks at things, though. We have to compare ourselves to God, and in the sight of God, we are definitely sinners. Um, people understand they're not perfect. They may not be pleased to be called a sinner. And I've had some people object pretty vociferously uh, to being called a sinner, okay? Because to them, a sinner means someone who's awful. A sinner means a murderer, an adulterer, um, you know, something like that. Some really, really, really bad person, you know, a mass murderer or something. Um, what we have to do is, is help them to understand what sinner means. Um, some people think that sinner is an old-fashioned idea. It's just totally out of date. People aren't sinners because we're all allowed to set our own standard. And whatever we choose to think is right, that's right. And that whatever we choose to think is wrong is wrong. So we, we set our own terms. Well, that doesn't work with God. Okay, God is the sovereign of the universe. Sin is anything that is contrary to his character and his commandments. Okay, it's not a matter of what you think or what I think. If I think something is right and God says it's wrong, it's wrong. Okay, it's as simple as that. Now, let's go back to Romans chapter 3, verse 23, because this can be very helpful in explaining what sin is. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The word for sinned here in the Greek language is the word hamartano, hamartano, and it means to miss the mark. It's as though you were shooting at a target. Maybe you're using a rifle, a pistol, maybe you're using a bow and arrow, but you're shooting at a target. Maybe you're playing darts, and you're trying to hit the target. Well, hamartano, the, verse, the word that's translated send, literally means to miss the mark. You don't hit the bullseye. Okay, now the truth of it is, most of us are not even going to hit the target, much less the bullseye, okay? But God's standard of perfection is what we're aiming at, and we all fall short. We all miss the mark, okay, to some degree. You might get closer than me, but you still don't hit it, okay? That's the point. For all have sinned, we have all missed the mark and come short of the glory of God. We have failed to reach God's standard of holiness, of righteousness, of perfection. Okay? So we have missed the mark. Um, you can compare yourself to other people. And you look better than one person and you look worse than another. That's what I did as a teenager growing up. And I would look at people around, and I can remember a fellow named Charles Johnson, who to my mind was the top, okay? This was a guy who was such a good person. He was just clean living, decent, kind, friendly, okay? He was a really good guy. But then there was another one. I won't mention his name, but there was another guy that I looked at and I thought, well, good grief. He does this and this and this and this. He goes out every weekend and gets drunk. He does all kinds of awful, awful things. Okay? So I looked at Charlie, and I looked at this unnamed character, and I thought, well, I'm better than him, but I'm not as good as him. And so I hope I'll get to heaven when I die. I hope God will look at me and say, well, you're good enough. And that's what most people are trying to do, not be all that good, but good enough. And they're judging themselves according to their own standards. And it doesn't work that way. God is the sovereign of the universe. He's the judge. He sets the standards, and he says we've all fallen short. Okay? So we need to compare ourselves to God, and we see that we have failed and take our place as sinners. Okay? All right, so that's the first uh, doctrine that you need to, to convey to people. Uh, and again, it's usually not very hard. In America, all it means usually is saying something to the effect that, you know, I've sinned, 
you know, quote them a Bible verse, but then say, I've sinned, you've sinned, we've all sinned. None of us is as good as God. And most people are willing to accept that. The result and penalty of sin, this is number two, the result and penalty of sin is death, which means separation from God forever. Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin, that means what you receive because you have sinned, is death. Okay, the penalty, the payment for sin is death, but the gift of God. I want you to see that, notice the contrast here in, in this verse. The wages of sin, which is what you earn, is death, what you deserve. But the gift of God is eternal life. A gift is free, it's not earned, it's not deserved, it's given by someone else. So you've got what you've earned, which is death. The gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, something God gives you. Uh, Revelation chapter 20 and verse 14 and 15 says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Back in verse 23, chapter 6, verse 23, it says, The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. That death that we have earned is not just physical death, it's also spiritual death, separation from God forever. Revelation 20 calls it the second death, and it says that they are cast into the lake of fire. Okay, those who are not written in the book of life are cast into the lake of fire. Um, Revelation chapter 21 and verse 27, that's speaking of heaven, Okay, the eternal heaven, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Okay, if a person, it says here, anything that defileth or, or works abomination or makes a lie, okay, who hasn't told a lie? Every single one of us has lied. There's not a person on the earth that has been 100% honest their entire life. Well, if you make a lie, you cannot enter into heaven, okay? God is holy. His home, heaven, is a perfect place, a holy place, and you cannot go to heaven with your sin on you, okay? So we have presented that we're all sinners, and because of our sin, none of us deserve heaven. None of us can hope to get to heaven. Instead, our destiny is eternal death in the lake of fire. Okay, that's what we have, have tried to establish here. So God is a holy God. He loves us, but he hates our sin. Our sin will separate us from him forever. The wages of sin, the penalty we deserve is death, eternal death. The gift which God offers freely is eternal life. Well, how can a holy God give eternal life to people deserving of hell and still be holy? Okay, if, if an earthly judge <coughs> set loose a man that had been proven to be a murderer, we would say that that judge was a wicked judge, an evil judge. Well, how can a holy God give eternal life give entrance into heaven to people who are wicked sinners. He couldn't, except he makes a way himself. Uh, the next doctrine, Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God, died in our place and paid the debt for our sins. Okay? Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God, died in our place and paid the debt for our sins. The wages of sin is death. Death is the payment for sin. Okay, that's why Christ died. Uh, let's give you some verses on this. And there are many, but we're trying to keep this simple at this point. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. 
But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrates or shows, he manifests his love toward us, <clears throat> in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Okay, so the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross for us. He paid for our sins. He demonstrates the love of God by doing that. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Okay, so God loves us and he gave his Son as the sacrifice for our sin so that by believing in Christ we would have everlasting life. Isaiah 53 and verse 6, now here's a verse from the Old Testament written approximately 700 years before Christ. Okay? 700 years before Christ. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. Okay, we, we've all tried to leave the fold. We've all fled the shepherd. We've all, we've been like sheep. Okay, we've, we've turned everyone to his own way. And this is human nature. We all want to do our own thing. We all want to go our own direction. The Lord has laid on him, Jehovah has laid on Christ, the Messiah, the iniquity of us all. He put on Christ all of our sins. When Jesus hung on the cross, he bore our sins so that we could be saved. <clears throat> First Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Okay, Christ has one time suffered for sin. He died once for sin. He is the just, and he suffered for the unjust. Okay? He suffered for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened or made alive by the Spirit. So Christ died and was raised, and this was all for us so that he could take us to God. Uh, the wages or penalty for sin is death, both physical and spiritual. The payment for sin is not living a good life. Okay, remember, the wages of sin is death. It doesn't say the wages of sin is being a good person, being a religious person, performing religious rituals, or participating in ceremonies, or anything like that. Okay? Whatever you might think is a good thing, it may be good, but it's not the payment for sin. The payment for sin is death. Knowing that we are all sinners and incapable of saving ourselves, God sent his only son. Okay, I want you to think of this. God didn't have to do this. He looks at us and he sees sinners who cannot save themselves. He could have left us in that condition and sent us all to hell and been perfectly just in doing that. But he loves people. He loves his creation. He wants us to go to heaven. He wants us to live with him forever. So he sent his only son. He had to come up with a solution. The problem is we're sinners and cannot save our own souls. So how does God let us into heaven? He had to, to create a solution. So he came up with the plan of salvation, which offers sinners offers sinners heaven through faith in Jesus Christ. So he sent his son Jesus Christ to take our punishment and pay the debt that we owe to God. He died in our place, and that's how we get to heaven. Okay, the next one. Uh, righteousness is required for heaven, and Christ offers us his righteousness. Okay, to get to heaven, you know, one of my favorite verses is, is in, uh, I think it's Second Peter, if I remember correctly, Second Peter, and it says that we look 
for the new heaven and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Okay, righteousness is in heaven, and we have to be righteous to get there. Um, here's some verses for this. Romans chapter 4 and verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth in him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. But to him that worketh not, but believeth in him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Okay, righteousness is necessary for heaven. Righteousness is necessary to heaven, but we have no righteousness. There is none righteous, no, not one. We saw that just a few minutes ago. So how do we get to be righteous? But to him that worketh not. We don't get righteousness by working. Okay? You do your very, very best, and you're not righteous in the sight of God. But to him that worketh not, but believeth in him that justifieth the ungodly. We talked about justification earlier in this class. Um, to justify means to declare righteous. So the judge sitting on the, the judgment seat looks down at the accused and says, you are righteous, you are justified, you're not guilty. Well, how can God do that, do that for us when we are guilty? Okay, well, he does that because Christ took our place paid for our sins, dying on the cross, and now he justifies the ungodly. We're ungodly, but he justifies us. He declares us to be righteous. And it says our faith is counted for righteousness. Okay, we are credited with the righteousness of Christ himself. Okay, we're credited with his righteousness because we believe in Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. For he hath made him, for God, that's the Father, made Christ the Son, who knew no sin. Jesus was sinless. But he was made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in in him. Okay, one thing we're going to do a little bit later is to talk about the hand gesture, uh, which is a way to illustrate what happened when we trusted Christ, what happened first on the cross and our faith in Christ. Um, but God made Christ, who was sinless, to be sin for us. When he hung on the cross, God looked at his own son as a sinner and bearing the sin of the world. He had no sin, but our sin was placed on him so that by faith in him, we could be made the righteousness of God in him. Uh, another good verse, Philippians 3, 9. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith in Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Okay, we are found, if we trust in Christ, if we believe in him, we are found in him, not having our own righteousness, which is of the law, and the truth is the law proves we have no righteousness, but that which is through the faith of Christ, or faith in Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So we get to heaven, not by our righteousness, but by God's righteousness. Righteousness is required, and we have none, but God counts his righteousness to us. He credits us with the righteousness of Christ. He imputes it or counts it to us if we believe, if we have faith. Okay, so we're sinners, and we have no righteousness to offer God. Christ died to pay for our sins and offers his righteousness to us. How do we avail ourselves of the righteousness that he offers? Okay, well, the next thing you want to share with people is we can do nothing to be saved but believe. 
Salvation is all by God's grace through faith in Christ. Um, we have seen verses already that says that if we believe, if we have faith in Christ, He saves our souls. We've looked at John 3.16. We've looked at Romans 4.5, Philippians 3.9. Well, let me add a couple to this. And, and the next one, uh, these are verses that... Um, a fellow named Jim Williamson used when I trusted Christ as my Savior. And they are my favorite verses in the whole Bible because they opened my eyes to the truth of the gospel. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Another good one, uh, Titus chapter 3, verse 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Um, in, in presenting this, uh, first, you have nothing to offer God for salvation. Okay, the lost person needs to understand they are a sinner, they are guilty in the sight of God. They don't have anything to offer God. They cannot say, oh, look at me, I've done this and this and this and this and this, and I have got all of these good works, all of these good deeds to help me get to heaven. Um, I thought about bringing a, a uh, painting, kind of a painting to this class, um, a print, um, and I forgot it. Uh, maybe we'll work it into a, a future class. But it's a copy of a picture painted on the wall of a tomb in Egypt. It's a copy of a picture that is thousands of years old. Okay, thousands and thousands, oh wait, there it is right there. <laughs> I forgot, I loaned it to my son. Okay, does this show up? Okay, all right, so we've got this, this picture, and this is copied from an Egyptian tomb. These are hieroglyphics, these are, are word pictures painted by the Egyptians probably a couple of thousand years before the time of Christ. Okay, something like that. And you notice right here in the middle, you have got, oh, some people, and you've got an Egyptian god over here, and you've got this balance scale. And this god is weighing the goodness versus the sinfulness, the wickedness, of a person. And so on one side are the good deeds, and on the other side are the sins. And this is how the Egyptians thought you either went to torment forever or you went to heaven. Okay, this was their idea of religion, their idea of salvation. Good works versus sins. Okay, and the one that had the most the one that was the heaviest on the beam determined where you went when you died. This is exactly, now my idea of God certainly didn't look like this one with, I think this is supposed to be a jackal and it's got, you know, pointed ears and a point, kind of a pointy nose and such. It's a, a, an animal. Um, my idea of God was certainly not like that. Um, but lots of religions, like Hinduism, have gods that are, are animals or part animal and part man and so on. Um, but the idea of weighing your good deeds against your bad deeds, that's exactly what I thought it took to go to heaven. And your goodness, if, it, if your goodness outweighed your badness, then you went to heaven. If your wickedness outweighed your goodness, then you went to hell. Okay? That is the common idea of just about every religion. In fact, I think of every religion in the world. They have some idea of salvation, 
And to attain to that salvation, you have to have more good works than bad works. Okay? That's not Christianity. True Christianity is the opposite of every religion in the world. It is not what you do for God. It is what God did for you when He sent His Son to die on the cross and pay for your sin, to be raised from the dead, and to give you everlasting life. Okay, well, thank you, Matt. I didn't realize that that was here in your office, but I'm glad it was. Um, that's a terrific illustration. Every religion in the world is the same. Oh, their gods look the same, their gods have different names, their rituals and their, their ceremonies are different from each other, and that kind of thing. But they all boil down to if you're good enough, you'll go to heaven, to whatever their heaven might be. If you're not good enough, you'll go to hell, whatever their idea of hell is. Okay, some of them, hell is just, you stay here, and you just keep coming back and coming back and living a miserable life and a miserable life and a miserable life. You die, you're reborn, you die, you're reborn, and it's an awful existence, and that's their idea of what hell is, which is pretty awful. Um, Okay, so you have nothing to offer God. <laughs> if, if there was a scale like that, guess what? The, the goodness side, the righteousness side, would be empty. There would be nothing there whatsoever. And your wickedness, your sins, plus your righteousnesses, which in the sight of God are filthy rags, they'd all be on the one side. And you would never go to heaven. Praise God, he's gracious. Praise, praise God, he's merciful and kind. Well, let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, a little bit at a time, okay? He says, for by grace. Grace means unmerited favor, undeserved mercy. Okay, unmerited favor, undeserved mercy. He's talking about something you have not earned, you have not deserved you don't have any right to it, any right to expect it. For by grace are you saved. That means to be rescued from hell and given eternal life. Okay? Rescued from hell and given eternal life. Now there's a lot more to salvation than just that. But that's the main thing we, <coughs> we need to consider. Rescued from hell and given eternal life. Through faith. Faith means dependence on Jesus Christ alone. Okay? It doesn't say, for by grace are you saved through faith and going to church, through faith and being baptized, through faith and being a good person, through faith and being religious, through faith and stopping your sins, through faith and... It doesn't say anything. Through faith. Faith alone. It's not a combination of faith in Christ plus good things. And it's certainly not a combination of faith in Christ and some other deity, okay, which some people think it is, that it's, it's multiple deities helping to get you to heaven. Um, it's not of yourselves. There's nothing that you can do for it, okay? Nothing whatsoever that you can do for it. It doesn't emanate, it doesn't come from anything you can possibly do. Okay, salvation is not of yourselves. All right? It, salvation, is the gift of God. It's, it's a gift, it's free. Okay, now I'm sure many of you gentlemen have worked jobs, you probably work a job now, and you put in your time, you do your work, you do your job, and you get paid for it. Okay, whatever that job may be. Okay, if, if you work in an office, you put in your 40, 50, 60 hours a week, whatever it might be, whatever's expected over there, you do your work, and at the end of the week, or every two weeks, or whatever, the boss pays you. You have earned that money. It's not a gift, okay? A gift you don't work for. 
a gift is not earned. A gift is not necessarily, in fact, it's not deserved in any way. The person giving the gift doesn't have to give it to you. They don't owe you. Okay? But out of the goodness of their heart, they give to you. Okay? So a gift is free. You can't work for it. You can't pay for it. Uh, you men that are, are uh, fathers, and probably some of you are, your fathers, um, <laughs> what would you think if you gave your, let's say your son or your daughter, you gave them a gift? Maybe it's a Christmas gift, maybe it's a birthday present, something of that nature. What would you think if they offered to, to pay for it? If they said, oh, Dad, I have worked hard and I have earned some money and I'd be glad to give you this for this gift that you gave me. You can't buy a gift. A gift is free. You'd be insulted if your children thought they had to pay for it. And you would never ask them to pay for it because it's free, it's a gift. Um, you might remember uh, we earlier quoted Romans chapter 6 verse 23, for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is what? Eternal life. Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, well, so we've covered Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 but then we get to verse 9. And I think I've mentioned to you before in a previous class that this is what changed my mind. This is what caused me to put my faith in Christ. This is what convinced me of the truth of the gospel. I had been to church, a lot of churches, growing up, and had gotten the idea that good boys go to heaven and bad boys go to hell, and if I would try to be good enough, that I might go to heaven. And so I was hoping to earn salvation. I was hoping to earn heaven. I wasn't working at it very hard, okay, but I was hoping that I would be good enough to get in. Uh, but then Jim Williamson showed me this verse, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I've said before, I believe, that at that moment, the thought occurred to me I have been lied to all my life. <coughs> Baptist preachers, Methodist preachers, Presbyterian preachers had told me that if I would be good, I might go to heaven. I had to be good enough to get in. And so I hoped I was good enough. And all the time the Bible had said very, very clear and plain, not of works lest any man should boast. As far as getting to heaven is concerned, you can forget about that piling up of good deeds. Okay? You can forget about trying to help the scale tilt the right way. That's not how you go to heaven. Okay? It's by the grace of God. For by grace are you saved through faith. Okay? We're saved by grace rescued from eternity in hell, and given a home in heaven forever through faith in Jesus Christ. There's nothing you or I can do about it. We cannot get there on our own. Not, not, we cannot help get there. Okay, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. Up in heaven, and I'm glad of this, there will be no one up there bragging about themselves. No one is going to be up there bragging about how good they were, okay? <laughs> there used to be a, years ago, there used to be a tradition in the United States of giving people perfect attendance pens for Sunday school, okay? And I knew a guy who had nine years of perfect attendance in Sunday school, okay? He thought he was a pretty good guy. Well, praise God, later on, he trusted Christ as his Savior. Okay, he understood it was not of works, lest any man should boast. But if good works got you to heaven, heaven would be intolerable because everybody would be bragging about the works that they did to get themselves to heaven. 
Well, praise God in heaven, we won't be boasting of ourselves. Instead, we'll all be talking about Jesus Christ and the salvation that He and He alone have provided for us. Okay, the last uh, point in the gospel presentation. You may know you are going to heaven because eternal life is eternal. Okay, and I really think this is very important. When you are witnessing to someone, you need to leave them with the assurance of their salvation. Not just get them to make a profession of faith, but get them to understand that they know they're going to heaven. Okay? And here's, here's a way that you can find out um, if they have understood you. Okay? If they don't understand yet, then they will not have assurance. Okay? And that's important to find out. Uh, because they may not have understood the gospel and trusted Christ yet. Um, okay, you may know you're going to heaven because eternal life is eternal. We saw in John 3.16, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay, what did Jesus promise to those who believe? Everlasting life. In John chapter 6, verse 47, this is a, a really important verse. Christ said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. So he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, I'm telling you the truth, I say this to you, if you believe in me, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you have everlasting life. You have, not you will get, you have everlasting life right now. Okay? 1 John 5, 13. These things I have written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have, present tense, eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Um... Well, there's a couple of other verses that I'm, I might include in this in a few minutes, but we'll, we'll cover these, these basic things and, and we'll see if we have time for those. Um, the presentation, God promises everlasting life. You know, when you trust in Christ, what you're doing is taking God at His word. You're saying this book is the word of God. And in that book, God made promises to me. And I believe those promises. I am trusting Jesus Christ. I am believing what He has said. I'm believing He paid for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead. I am believing that He has saved my soul. Okay? So you're, you're trusting God's Word. He has made you a promise. Do you believe that promise? If you believe the promise, you should be able to say, I know I'm going to heaven. I know I'm going to heaven because God has given me everlasting life. By definition, it has to last forever. And if it doesn't last forever, then God lied to you. Doesn't, doesn't the scripture tell us that it's impossible for God to lie? Well, certainly it does. God cannot lie. Okay? If He gave you eternal life, He gave you eternal life. It cannot end. If it does end, then God's a liar. And that, I have a hard time even saying that as a, as a proposition. Okay? God cannot lie. He is not a liar. Okay? I'm going to heaven because God told me. Um, 1 John 5.13, we're going to, again, break this down. These things I have written to you. You that do what? You that believe on the name of the Son of God. So if you believe in Jesus Christ, then this is written to you. Are you one of those that believe in Jesus Christ? Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? Have you come to the understanding that you're a sinner 
You cannot get to God. You cannot earn heaven. You cannot do anything to get to heaven. But Jesus died in your place. He paid for your sins. He was buried and raised again. He's alive and he's given you everlasting life. Are you one of those who have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? If so, this verse is written to you. Okay, it's not written to everyone. These things have I written to you that believe on the name of the Son of God. If you're a believer, it's written to you. Okay, so God is talking to you right now in this Bible verse that you may know, K-N-O-W, okay, little four-letter word in the English language, you may know, not hope, not guess, not wish, not fret over, not worry about, okay, you may know, positively, you may know that you have, another little four-letter word in the English, a verb this time, and it's, it's present tense. No is present tense as well. You may know you have present tense. That means right now. It's not future. It doesn't say you may know that you will get everlasting life. Okay, most people think that eternal life starts if you're saved. If you're going to have an eternal life, it starts when you die or when you stand before God and He judges you to be righteous. Okay, that's not so. Okay, eternal life starts the moment you believe. If you believe, you may know that you have right now everlasting life. Well, if you have everlasting life right now at this moment. If you have it at this moment, if it ends, let's say five years from now, you do something awful. You commit some terrible sin and God takes that everlasting life away from you. Was it everlasting? No, it wasn't. God lied to you. God cannot lie to you. You have, not will get, but you have it right now, eternal life. Not life until you sin again. Not life until you sin too bad. But you have it right now. Right now you have life that by its very definition has to last forever. Okay? Do you know and you're going to ask this to the person that you're, you're witnessing to. If you were to die today, would you go to heaven? If they say, well, I don't know. Or if you said, if you did something really bad, would you still go to heaven? Then you're, you're and, and they say, well, I don't know, I don't think so. If I did something really bad, I'd probably go to hell. If they say that, then they probably haven't really understood the gospel. And you need to go back and go through it again and show them again Christ died for all sin, for all people, not just for some of your sins. He didn't die for the little ones and let you pay for the big ones. Okay, he died for all sin. And beloved, Jesus died, it's almost 2,000 years ago. Okay, just a few years, about 10 years, it's going to be 2,000 years since Jesus died. When he died, all of our sins were in the future. And he paid for all sin, for all people. Okay, all of those people that reject Christ, he died for them and paid for their sins. And they, they, salvation could be theirs if they would only believe. Okay, so quiz people and ask them, if you were to die today, would you go to heaven? And make sure that you leave them 
rejoicing in the fact that they're born again, they're saved, they're God's children now, they have a home that's going to last forever and ever and ever in heaven. All right, thank you very much.